in then. Well, welcome everybody to this week's Art Business Podcast. Uh, my guest today is Claire Mander, uh, who is currently the director of the CoLab uh, Limited, um, which is an art organisation, I think, based in London. Um, and I'm going to keep you waiting before we actually, uh, if you haven't heard of CoLab, which I hope you have, I'm going to keep you waiting and we'll, we'll discuss that later on. Um, but Claire, I'm going to just, um, and Claire has had a lot of other um, very, very interesting experiences, art world um, career experiences, and we'll we'll be talking about those in a moment. Um, but Claire, I'm going to just start in the usual way so that so that listeners can hear something about yourself. So do you have a favourite city and any reasons for that? Well, I think uh, I do have a favourite city and I've decided not to say London because I thought that was too obvious. So I will go for a, a city which is always very close to art because um, I lived there when in my early 20s and I suppose it's probably a favourite of a lot of people, um, which is Paris. And the reason really I is because every time I go there, I feel so... Uh, close to everything that's going on and there is this unchangeability to it really but I suppose it's the fact that they really have this uh they embrace the idea of the patrimoine and they have a, an amazing civic pride in their buildings and their architecture and their food and everything that their way of life really which they protect which I think is such a special and it's such a it's such a rare thing, which I, I think probably somewhere like London doesn't have. I think that you studied French undergraduate level, am I right in saying? Yes, yeah, so I studied uh, French and I spent a year during my degree living in Paris. What was but that, I, your history of art degree? Yes, yeah, so I did French and history of art and I studied, um, I, they actually enrolled me into the Art Plastique uh, course at the Sorbonne and of course Art Plastique right. is uh, uh, fine art so I arrived on the, fi the first day saying uh, I think there's been some mistake madame I do not know how to draw and I don't know how to sculpt I'm in the wrong place and it took nine months to try and get me onto the right course at which point um, you know I was already leaving so I spent most of my time at the Institut Britannique which was a superb experience because uh, the courses in language and culture and literature are really um, unrivaled, I think. And it Sounds gave me a lot of free time to walk around Paris. And <laughs> <laughs> so have a great walking, time. when you're walking around Paris, were there any particular buildings, churches, art galleries that you tend to return to each time you revisit Paris? Any kind of real favourites? Well, well, I spent um, a lot of the nine months in the in the archives of the Musée Rodin, which wow. has since been much modernised and I think has lost a lot of its charm. It's been over cleaned, which the French have a, a, a tendency to do. Mm. They don't really adopt the British principles of restoration at all. Um, but it was a very special thing being up in 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 the in Rodin's archives and reading his letters so every time I go back to Paris I, I can't resist I'm drawn back there um, was, was that part of research for a dissertation at undergraduate or master's level it, it, it was part of my undergraduate um research and okay. I was looking at the way that um Rodin used uh, uh basically the, the process of his work that it was that he had um, a studio full of different pieces of different figures and that he would walk around this studio and he would literally just take a man and a woman and put them together and see what that made so I was looking at uh, a work called Je suis belle which is of a man carrying aloft uh, one of his crouching women in a very it's a very beautiful essay in balance and power and you know the opposition of a curled in form and a straightened out form and it's a it's a it's a fantastic work um so yes i'm just very special to be inside an artist you know up to your eyes in an artist papers and 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 being in the museum at night when there was nobody there and being able to 
touch and photograph the works and look at all the archives was quite special. Yeah, Rodin's such an interesting artist. Um, I think probably a, a lot of my students listening will probably think, oh, Rodin, the kiss, and quite a traditional artist sculptor. But as you know, and anyone who's been to a, an exhibition of Rodin's work, what a what a sort of proto-modern sculptor, um, you mm. know, leaving the marks of the making on the on the sculptures. Um, you know, it kind of almost reminded me of a uh, more recent artist, Eduardo Palozzi. I've actually got a plaster cast of one of his feet mm. that his daughter gave me once. And it's got, it, oh he God. also continues this notion of the, of the sculpt, the unfinished sculpture, or, you know, with bits of metal on it that are part of the make. And Rodin's already doing that in the late 19th century. Yeah, I mean, he really was, he really was incredible. And just these assemblages, you know, just throwing things together that he's found lying around the studio. I mean, it's all, it was all happening back then. And then you also struggle with the, with the issue that he was a sort of despicable man. And, you know, which is, which is also another thing, which is very, which, which, which you have to sort of grapple with as an art historian. Um that, it's know, a big issue question. at the moment, isn't it? You know, do you stop studying the Jimmy Savile effect? Yeah. Do you stop studying an artist or composer when you discover they were probably a paedophile or whatever? It's one of I the know. great ethical questions at the moment. Can you divorce it's... the art from the person? Yeah, and I think, but I think that I think the conclusion that I've recently come to is that really you can't separate you know, the beauty of some, beauty and horror, two sides of the same coin, really, aren't they? And it, they've, beauty doesn't really ever exist in isolation. You know, there's always something, uh, there's always something lurking in order to bring it into focus. And I guess um, that's what we as, as consumers of art love about it, that the best artists are ambiguous. And they, mm. because they have that dark and light side as we all have as human beings. <laughs> We're yes. going to get philosophical yes. here. Do you have I a know, favorite? Already. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Do you have a favorite, like, country, you know, non urban location? It might be a seaside location, an island location, or maybe a countryside location. Well, I'm sitting in my favorite countryside location, which is um, where I'm currently conducting a drawing residency, which is um, Alpen Manor, which is in the Cotswolds in, in Gloucestershire. But I, but but you just saying seaside location um, uh, makes me think of a place that I've fallen in love with really in I suppose 2018 or so when I did a project in Morecambe Bay which nobody's heard of even I have. though it stretches to a hundred miles <laughs> even though it stretches to a hundred miles it's just south of the Lake District and it's the, it's this extraordinary and very overlooked place. Uh, that combines an amazing array of all these different aspects of life. You walk onto the shore and you have this extraordinary, you're engulfed in this sunset. And on the one side you have a, on your right hand, you have this sixth century burial ground. And then you, your eye goes over to the left and you have a nuclear power station. And yeah. it's just this extraordinary mix of, you know, grinding poverty and then some really quite comfortably off people some beautiful landscapes some horrific I mean monstrous uh buildings <laughs> and it, it's just it, it's absolutely extraordinary I think it just encapsulates you know the whole of human the whole of human endeavor really that place so I absolutely I'm completely captivated by it that whole coastline um does does where the Anthony Gormleys are, um, just trying to remember that is that beach location north of Liverpool, is that part of Morecambe yeah. Bay or south of it? No, it's not. It's actually one bay down. Yes, that's right. I mean, I, we took the students yeah. there for the Liverpool Biennial one year. We obviously went out mm. to see these amazing Gormleys, which for the listeners, you should look it up. They, they're mm. basically his typical kind of bronze anthropomorphic nude uh, sculptures, life-size sculptures, but they stand in the surf, in the sea, and the the... British tides for those of you who haven't been to the British coastline it's fair you know it it runs it it runs far out and far in and we get surf and so on and it it gradually uncovers these statues at low tide and then they're covered up gradually it's a and they're, they're a major menace to anyone trying to surf apparently mm, yeah I can imagine mm. And that is that's kind of south of I think the Morecambe Bay that you're you're talking about. Mm -hmm. but, um, that whole area is very paradoxical, isn't it? Because I've stood on Scafell, which is the highest mountain in England, not very high, 
Um, right. And you can see on a clear day, you can see down into Morecambe Bay and you can see, I think, probably Sellafields, the nuclear power mm -hmm. is the name of the power station, mm -hmm. quite controversial. Um, so it's got these curious sort of mixtures of the most amazing yeah. wilderness. Um, mm. and, and yet these kind of, you know, nuclear power station, which they're trying to decommission, etc. And as you say, a lot of poverty. And I think yeah. in Morgan Bay, you've got this fantastic tidal effect, haven't you? Yes, yes. It, it rushes out, it gallops out. You have to be very careful. Back in again. And yeah, and you have to be pretty careful. Yeah, it's extremely mm. treacherous. Yeah. Um, but you can, at certain times of the year, walk across the bay, the whole of the bay. It takes about three hours to walk. Wow. All the way across it on the flat sands. So that's an exciting uh that's an exciting thing to do. Well that's an unusual one, and that, that that's it's very poetic. It's a, a lot of English literature is filled with this love of the the, the sea for you know from, from probably earlier than Dickens onwards. Mm -hmm. Um so so any kind of building that you would say you love as a piece of architecture? Well, so I'm really I think and actually it was interesting being asked uh these questions because <laughs> you know what my my I mean if you asked me tomorrow I'd probably say something different than I would say today because I think it's so difficult to yeah. uh to say whether you have a favorite it is but I think currently at this precise second in time <laughs> <laughs> I would say that my favorite uh building is um one that I saw recently in Japan called the Teshima Art Museum, which mm -hmm. was conceived by an architect called Rui Nishizawa. And he was asked to conceive of um, just, you know, whatever he wanted to do. And he, he created a sunken, almost like a pod with two apertures. And you walk inside this pod, which displays the finest of uh, Japanese structural engineering and the local uh expertise in steel structures and poured cement technology it's a i mean it's just an extraordinary thing it's like being inside a cave a big white minimalist cave and he worked with uh an artist who is called ray naito and she is a very well known and uh very profound Japanese artist and she made an intervention into the building which you would never even conceive of occurring in England which consists of droplets of water which rise from underneath the building and the droplets of water make their way naturally to join other droplets of water and then those droplets of water sink into unseen holes in the ground and the purpose of the architecture and the work is that you spend time in this space where there's a distortion of sound. You spend time looking at this water, which moves slowly, and it's you're meant to be there in silence, which, of course, the Japanese are highly capable of doing. <laughs> and you look at nature. You look at the sky that you can see through the apertures, and you look at the trees, and it is an absolutely sublime experience. I don't think there's any other way of describing it. So I think that... And that is a building, really. Did you, did you that, say it was an art museum? Well, they it, it's conceived of as an art museum, and they had intended to have different artists making work for it. But then this marriage of architecture and work was so perfect that they've just left it as it is. So the whole <laughs> thing is sort of, in a very sort of Baroque way, the mm. entire, I mean, you know, the other sort of side of Baroque, but it's it's become this incredible unified artwork so anyone going to japan you recommend it is, it is. <clears throat> mm. sounds fantastic <clears throat> it reminds me your experience of it and your description i haven't seen it i don't know it i will look it up um it reminds me of um some of like turrell's work um mm. you know, that i there's one at yeah. um there's one at houghton hall that was commissioned by uh, the mm -hmm. owners of Houghton Hall for their gardens permanently and it, it's like a typical Tarrell Square space it's all white and you walk up round stairs and then you find yourself in almost like an, a Pompeian house with a like an atrium there are benches around the sides it's all white and there's just a square aperture in the roof that allows you to look at the sky both by day and by night and there's a similar one um, that I took our students to down when we go down to St Ives there's this beautiful place called Tremin here 
Gardens, which is a sculpture yeah. park outside of Penzance. Do you know it? And there's a turrel yes. there, which is like a Bronze Age burial mound. And you go through this kind of ritualized uh, yeah. corridor and yeah. um, almost like walking into a tomb. And it's oval, if I remember right. It's got an oval aperture. And students just love it. They just sit there for ages, just quiet, contemplating it. It sounds as though this Japanese work is a, has a similar poetry. Mm. Mm -hmm. I've just sent you a picture of it so you can. Oh, great! I'll put it. See. I'll put it. So I think. So I think the. Um, yeah, I, th I think there are definitely there are definitely some similarities between yeah. those two, and obviously James Turrell is a. Um, Sorry, James Turrell. I think I said Richard Turrell. James is you know is an incredible uh really is an incredible artist Abs um, absolutely and you you spoke about Claire you spoke about the sounds being important with the water yeah. um in in this Japanese um, museum in the inverted commerce gallery um so so what about do you listen to music are there any again it's this difficult question like it at the very present time is there music you're listening to, or if you had to choose your desert island disc, one thing that you could take to your island, what would it be? <laughs> it would probably be a mixtape, because okay, right. <laughs> frankly, <A playlist. laughs> frankly, I'm very uh, open-minded mm. in terms of the music that I listen to, but I, in order to narrow it down, I would say probably anything that's good to dance to. So <laughs> whether it's gypsy jazz or you know, trance music or Ravi Shankar playing on his tabla or, you know, I go a lot to, to the opera. I think there is such a an amazing wealth of different types of music across the across the ages. Uh, but essentially, yeah, I, I would be very happy if it's a song to dance to. Because that's <laughs> so, very good all around. So are you the kind of person that dances on the road, that puts music on and just likes to dance on their own or do you like to do this as a sort of social level i don't well I, we dance uh yeah i mean i just any opportunity basically <laughs> <laughs> i've got two left feet so i'm really envious of people with, uh, with no, i, I just... watch them and i think why what have they got that i haven't why won't my body move to this music and yeah i love <laughs> listening to music you know it's really weird my body yeah, just no, it's, respond. it's just very no very sort of informally you know around the kitchen table and that kind of thing <laughs> <laughs> it's great. No, honestly, I always think also I miss dancing. I miss weddings where there's, you know, there's mm. seem to be less and less of these occasions when you can just go and and the whole family are there and everyone doesn't mind making a fool of themselves. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult. Great. To do that yeah, these days. it's yeah, so I, it's really great. I agree with that. So, so finally, can you? Do you have any early memories of suddenly realizing that something was art, or you know, because I think I think art is such a strange thing that you know we find it hard to define, even when we studied it all our lives. I would say so. I just always wonder to myself, when did I first see something and someone told me it was art? And I thought, what's that? And why is it art? Do you have any early memories of art? Well, I think we, I suppose, a really early memory would be. Um, it was, I, can't, I don't know who the artist was, but it was a bronze sculpture. We used to go and visit a lot of um, houses. My father was quite interested, you know, in an amateur way, was quite interested in architecture. So mm -hmm. we used to go and visit houses and so forth. And I do always remember this um, uh, reclining figure, quite abstract, probably uh, modern British or mm. something like that, of, of a figure. And I remember being quite entranced about that. Um, but then it just sort of, it it really developed. And then, and, and really after that, I, just, I suppose I just sort of fell into it. Um, I mean, I've never really been able to, always wanted to be able to draw, um, but have never really been very good at it. And same. that's not just being modest. <laughs> yeah, no, it's the same here. People often say, how, the, how can't you, you spend your life with, around with art? Why can't yeah. you do it? You know, I don't I know. know. <laughs> I don't know. And I think that's the fascination. I think that probably is why we do it, because we mm. can't understand, you know, how people do it, because it is such an extraordinary, it's such an extraordinary thing to bring into the world. But so 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 after that I really fell into it because mm -hmm. I um had I was quite a good linguist, but I didn't really have any other special skill, shall we say. So mm -hmm. I um 
didn't really know what to do for A level. And it was suggested that I, you know, when people didn't know what to do for A level, they were just told to do history of art because yes. it was because pe for some reason people think it's an easy A level, which I just mm. can't understand because actually I think it's one of the most difficult A levels there is mm -hmm. because you're trying to learn a whole new visual language, uh, express things, and a whole new canon of work yeah. that relates to so many other things, which relates to all the history of every period and all the literature and it's global and it's, I mean, it's just, yeah. it's phenomenal in scale. Um, and I was very lucky because I had a, a, you know, very good teachers. And for that, for that A-level, they asked us again to write a dissertation, uh, at which point I wrote a letter to um, Elizabeth Frank. <laughs> I said, dear Mrs. Frink, I really love your work and I've got to do an A-level dissertation. Can I come and see you? And she said, that would be delightful. Come to my studio. Wow. And um, and I think that was really when I decided that sculpture is the thing. <laughs> it is the most important thing. And, um, and I thought found I had a real interest in living artists and I think those are the kind of two big decisions aren't they whether you're going to whether you're more interested in living artists or whether you're more interested in dead artists what was have, it about, I, haven't, I haven't ever spoken on this podcast about Elizabeth Frink I've probably spoken mm. about Barbara Hepworth in the context of St Ives um, mm. what, would you like to tell the listeners because I'd suspect most of the listeners probably don't know Elizabeth Frink. Um, I, I do you think does she have an international reputation? I, I tend to think of her maybe ignorantly as someone that probably only British people interested in art know. And there's quite a lot of public sculptors of her work. I, I guess um, my feeling is that I see her as quite a naturalistic sculptor who like often <laughs> has horses. Is that is that a wrong <laughs> opinion, Claire? <clears throat> no, I think she's slightly. Um... <clears throat> She's she's definitely very much a British um, sculptor, and I suspect you're right that she's not that well known abroad. Although I, I, I suppose in terms of the market, I it wouldn't surprise me if she had a, a quite a robust American market. Mm -hmm. um, she was very interested in uh, she she was making a lot of work uh, after the war, and she was actually a very successful in her own lifetime and she made uh, a lot of work which was about the interrelationship between the human and the animal particular mm -hmm. particularly the the horse and rider and there's a very beautiful example of her work which has now been thankfully recited um on old bond street uh, from Piccadilly in the middle of the cafe nero i remember that <laughs> it used to be right <laughs> beside that? the tables in drinking coffee <laughs> could you believe it? And you try, had to sort of ask people to move so you could see. Yes, and they used to put their cups <laughs> on. <Fine. the> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. amusing. That was quite strange. <laughs> oh, but they've done a great thing moving it. Um, but but I don't know. I think she sort of gets a bit of bad press because she did a lot of work about animals, mm. but which is not a subject which people think is terribly serious. Mm. Uh, but actually, I think she's a fantastic, and also she's figurative, which is now not fashionable. Um, although she, I suppose, wasn't, I mean, she was figurative, but she wasn't necessarily working from life, or a lot of it was from the imagination. So she did, when they found the Riachi bronzes, for example, she did these over life-size monumental figures of these very strange uh, beings that had been drawn up from the bottom of the ocean uh, and actually when you went into her studio she had these huge goggled heads which were these nightmarish um, heads with that were bronze and they were probably about uh, a meter and a half high at least with these bronze polished goggles on them which were very reminiscent of uh, awful you know dictatory soldier types imposing their will rather forcefully and they were very you know very frightening and dotted around her her garden and thing but I, I think I mean I think she, she's getting a lot more critical attention 
now. Um, but I, yeah, I think, and, and also because she was a woman sculptor, of course, that, you know, there's less, um, there's less attention given to her. But yeah, I think she's worth, she's worth looking at. She's a very good way into sculpture, put it that way. I mean, there may be, with the recent sort of revisionism of women artists, so that, you know, maybe that she becomes part of that eventually. Um, mm -hmm. The Riachi statues that, just for the listeners, um, the Riachi statues, I think it was 1972, they they were kind of found, they were found underwater by divers off the toe of Italy, Cape Riachi. They're now in Reggio Calabria Museum in the south of Italy. And they are, have you seen them, Claire? Have you been to see them? I haven't, no. I, I mean, they, they, I've been several times and as a classicist and they're, 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 they're really amazing. Um, mm. And the reason that they sent shivers down our spines, I remember having going to a slide lecture at the Institute of Classical Studies by a couple of Italian archaeologists. They This was the first time we'd seen any images of them. You know, this is pre-internet. Mm. We're talking, mm. if you think about 70s. And it, literally everyone oohed and aahed when they saw mm. these. They're, they're so naturalistic and so idealised. Um, pretty well preserved for bronze. They've lost, they've got patinas. They've lost their bronzed polished appearance and you know one of them's lost his helmet it took them something like six or seven years to conserve in Florence and then the people of Rome and Florence said there's no way they're going back into southern Italy which is poor and uncultured and it's one of the great success stories that they did actually manage to argue that they go back to their fine spot but Frink if I remember weren't hers kind of like haven't they got white sludge on them or aren't they kind of Overpainted in white, or am I thinking of something else? Maybe I'm thinking of something else. There are, she does do that with some of yeah. her figures, yeah. Um, yeah. And I remember seeing them in various contexts. You know, I think quite a lot of private collectors were buying editions mm. of those. Um, but I think the point for the listeners is that those bronzes, although you know they've, they've pretty much been proven now to be classical fifth century BC, the time of the Parthenon or just before, mm -hmm. they're remarkable, yeah. well worth going to see. and the, the reason that they made were such a hit is because all we had was Roman marble copies of the freestanding athletic male nude statue. We knew all about it, but we didn't have any originals. To so, so suddenly see a 5th century BC statue in, contra, you know, a very early contrapositive figures was a remarkable point in the history of art. I mean, arguably in my lifetime, probably the most important find. But I'm obviously I'm looking at it from a classical mm. viewpoint, but I think traditional art historians would probably agree with me. Uh, because mm. we just haven't seen these things before and yet they used to make tens of thousands of these and they've yeah. all been melted down i yeah. know it's ordinary isn't it and then coming on to your graduate education claire um art history and and, and significantly law appears so you were at edinburgh london and courtal was i think you were at the studying law in london and obviously i think at edinburgh and courtal you studied art history do you want to say a little bit about that and maybe maybe any of your special special interest subjects or dissertations? So I did um, French and um, history of art at Edinburgh under a fantastic um, tutor called Elizabeth Cowling, who is a specialist in Matisse and Picasso and has mm -hmm. written some of the most um, important essays and texts. And yeah. it was really looking at work up until I said, 1880 to 1950, really, which mm -hmm. is a really fascinating period in the history of art but this was also there was also a focus on um Flemish Baroque and Islamic art under um a really extraordinary tutor called Hillen Brand uh so, so, so the vast um you know it, it was just a vast array really Incredible. and but, it's very interesting very unusual actually arguably or used to be you know, to be looking at having someone lecturing on Islamic art as oh. opposed to traditional Western. But it was so, I think it was such an important thing for all of us because yeah. to be able to look at not just the way that people made things, but this extraordinary narrative that the artists had to get control of and had to describe in a means that was often very small, uh, was, was at, you know, it, it kind of... Uh, it really opened our eyes, actually, to the fact that there's an awful lot going on and there's an awful lot informing uh, work that people make in, the, in, in, every, in every contemporary world that there is. Um, so th that was a very valuable and very rigorous experience. She was a very um, tough tutor. We had more sort of 
more work to do than anyone else, which seems <laughs> to have characterized characterized my uh, my interface with with tutors, which is you're you're sort of it's painful at the time, but you're grateful for it later. Um, it's quite interesting, um, actually. My current students and their laugh at this, and my alumni, they kind of complain about the workload, or a lot of them do, and they have like one assignment, maybe one extended essay for a unit. Um, oh uh, to be fair, they have a lot of different things to do because it's an art business course. They have to do a business plan. You know, it is quite wide ranging. Um, yes. But I, re I remember when I was studying Latin at university, we used to have to do an essay a week. And we used yes. to have to do like a translation into Latin from English every week. And we'd have tutorials yes. to make sure. And if you didn't turn up to the tutorial, you know, obviously there was no corporal punishment, but they made you feel it <laughs> if you ever didn't turn up for things. It's Mental quite a world, corporal isn't punishment. It? <laughs> <laughs> Bring it back. Yes. Um, oh gosh, this, I know, but it's, yeah, it's, it was quite a lot of pressure. But she used to make us do a presentation every week. Yep. With those nightmarish double slides. So you had to go to the <laughs> find the images, put yeah. up slides next to each other, tell people what you'd been looking into, because it, which is a very valuable skill, because yeah. a lot of working in the art world is about being articulate and presenting sure. ideas, and you have to be able to put it together quickly, and you have to make people understand what you're, what you're talking about, basically. Mm -hmm. And that theme very much continued when I went to the Courtauld by... Um, Professor Sarah Wilson, who's very well known for her amazing care of her students and support of her students, but also that she was very rigorous and she used to pretend to be asleep. And then you would say, and I'm talking about Duran's painting done in 1960s, September 1916 or something. She'd go, it wasn't 1916 and it was done in whatever town silly girl and then you do <laughs> and then you yeah, have and of course of the... course we can't i can't speak ever to my students in any kind of disrespect oh. where you know but we oh. used to, we used to be spoken to like that and whether it did us good or not i don't know um oh, it was terrifying it was terrifying <laughs> terrifying but good um i've heard i've heard similar anecdotes at sotheby's institute that, that there was this notorious called course, course called the works of art course that predated the institute and it's you know, uh, validated degrees um, that Sotheby's, people working at Sotheby's were made to do. Mm. <laughs> that, that was the start of the Institute. And you hear these stories. I'm not going to mention the names of the tutors, but anyone, anyone of the right age who knows, who, I, there, <laughs> there are a couple of people I know who had these teachers, but they were, they were also just like that really vicious no. with people throwing books at them if they got it wrong. And, oh my gosh, yeah. no, we didn't go to that level. We didn't go to that level. It was just a rap on the knuckles, you know, it was rap like, on, a, yeah, the kind of mental rap on the knuckles. Um, don't, yeah. you know, don't <laughs> say it if you're not sure. Just don't it's say a it. Change. Yeah. Um, but it's it was a brilliant, a, very so brilliant. Where did the law come in? Was it between? So the law, yeah, the law came in uh, after Edinburgh when I was, so just to be clear, I have no family background, no connections whatsoever in the art world nothing I had nothing to start with so mm -hmm. um everything was I had to sort of create and build myself so at the end of university um I, I mean there was basically no choice I had to earn some money mm -hmm. and I was you know realized that in no uncertain terms there was no there was no money coming mm -hmm. from anywhere and mm -hmm. so you have to earn some money somehow, and that is one way of doing it. Yep, yep. So that's what Absolutely. I did. But it was, and it was, um, I mean, it wasn't a very pleasant experience, I have to say. It was rather, uh, a, a definitely an unpleasant experience. Mm. But there are very many skills that came out of it that have been very, very useful. Probably, most importantly, um, not being baffled by people's language, particularly in bureaucratic settings. Yeah. And, and being able to, yeah, and, and being able to analyze um structures and being able to be organized actually. Mm -hmm. Bit like I always suppose that Latin, you know, learning Latin yes. helps on with that structure. 
and so on. And uh, obviously that feeds into law. At Courtauld, um, you've spoken about Sarah Wilson and as, as, as an inspiring, uh, if intimidating sometimes, due to, um, uh, what did you, yeah. what was your dissertation on? What did you choose to focus on in the end? As, did you do well, it? I, did. <laughs> I was actually, I was, um, I actually did it on, um, weirdly, and I'm not quite sure why I did it on this actually thinking about it but I did it on um inflatable architecture is that <laughs> random <laughs> and utopian the utopian use of the inflatable so people like archigram and then various contemporary uh or relatively contemporary French artists for example Pablo Reynoso mm -hmm. um and just the way that the inflatable in the 60s was a very um you know the whole idea of being able to be, they made everything out of plastic. They made whole environments and Ant Farm had a great inflatable thing that people ran across um, and into, and you could create these environments that would move with their own legs across the world and everything was gonna be okay. It was very, um, <laughs> it's so great though. I still it love- It's um, very unusual. And I'm thinking of Jeremy Deller's inflatable Stonehenge more recently it's brilliant isn't it i mean there's something about inflatables that just makes people really um really happy but um, like a bouncy yeah, was... castle but a work of art yeah exactly and that's a fun. great piece of work that's a great yeah. piece of work yeah um that's amazing and then then i think your early work was that you went to paris as i believe it to drew the, the the infamous or the historical parisian auction house <laughs> Which I encourage any listeners, they if you go to Paris, it's not an obvious place. I think there is Druo on the metro, and it's well worth going out to and experiencing an hour of the auctions in the famous historical Druo auction house. Do you want to talk about that experience? So that was after university, and um, I wanted to uh, do as the the the, uh, the general plan was that I would do as much, get as much work experience in the art world in any way possible, um, in order to gradually work out which bit of it was suitable and interesting mm -hmm. having having sort of basically rejected academia as an option mm -hmm. and um so i went to um start to work for um a very colorful commissaire priseur and the commissaire priseur in that at that time i think there were 50 across the whole of France and it was the definition of a monopoly because they were the only people who were allowed to buy and sell artworks in France which is absolutely unbelievable so when somebody died it was a commissaire priseur who did it and they got all the uh commission for it and they are huge experts I mean they're highly 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 trained and they have to do a degree in um history of art and a full degree in law and then they're allowed to start and then they set up their etude. So I was working with um, the most infamous, if it's possible to be, of, of all the commissaire priseurs. And he was called um, Maître Binoche. And Maître Binoche um, uh, was an absolute scandal because he put uh, an impressionist painting in a shopping mall in Japan because it was the time at which the Japanese were very interested in buying Japanese work. And the French art world went completely bananas. And they said, you can't defile a work like this. You know, you're making it into a commercial commodity and this is absolutely outrageous. And he just said, I don't care. I've just made the most money in the world from the sale of a painting. <laughs> he was a fantastic man with a really interesting collection, a very flamboyant Um I mean, really just an extraordinary, extraordinary man. And he continues to be an extraordinary man. Um, and yeah, that was quite an experience. We had, to, I had to do sort of buying and, you know, selling and it was like being a simultaneous translator, which was really, really, really difficult on the phones in the auction room, you know, pre-internet. Wow. So, and you, but it was so great. You, it was, a, it learned, was a really... you learned a lot about all sorts of different types of art, the physical object, which must have been, a, you know, a lot of people don't have that opportunity. Yeah. And and, and made some really great friends who uh, are now commissaire priseurs themselves. <laughs> and um, 
I'd love to see one. <laughs> oh, I know. Wouldn't it be amazing? And they all have these extraordinary collections because they can, they just, and, it, it, and it's very sort of, um, they have these amazing houses and then they <laughs> collect, you know, they have, the French are so brilliant at mixing contemporary and yeah. old things. And they have a particular interest in African masks or Japanese sure. armor or something. And they just mix the whole thing up with this incredible aesthetic sense. Yeah. I think Picasso when he was in Paris, I guess. It's exciting. It hasn't changed. The whole yeah. aesthetic has not changed. And they are yeah. just they're brilliant at it. And just just for just to remind listeners that part of this, um, I think, is the Commissaire Priseur also an au the auctioneers are another group, aren't they? But I, as I understand it, in France, you actually have to pass exams, whereas in yeah. London and New York, you just become an auctioneer. Just they just train you up in the auction house. You don't have to pass any exams. In France, I believe you you have to pass exams to become an auctioneer. Certainly do. Yeah, you certainly do, and they're very. Um... Yeah, it's very, very rigorous. And I think there are still very few. And then they limit the number of people because you then have to buy your etude. You have to buy an etude. So you have to wait for someone to die for an etude Ooh. to become available or for them to mm -hmm. sell their etude, but not many people sell them. So I there's a finite number of etude and you, you know, so the turnover is not, not great. This, yeah. this may have changed in the interim because obviously then the European Commission came in and they said, hang on a minute, this is a monopoly if ever I saw one. And they allowed um, Sotheby's and Christie's to um, start auctioneering. Yep. It was a that big... was, I remember it well. It was 2000. It was, I think it was 2000, start of the millennium. Before that, the current students, of course, weren't even born then. But before that, if you've gone to Paris, there was no Sotheby's, Christie's, only Drew and some other French auction houses. And I'm not certain the French, a lot of French art world people didn't like the sudden presence of Sotheby's and Christie's in Paris. I'm sure they didn't. No, I'm sure they didn't. Because the, <laughs> just, the, yeah. yeah, I mean, Drouot is actually, this, the, as I understand it, it's sort of the superstructure. And then all the etudes sell within the, that building, within those mm -hmm. rooms. So it's a kind of, um, it's, it's, it's an interesting structure. But yeah, no, I don't, I can imagine they couldn't, can't have been very pleased. Yeah. And what surprised me and my students when we first visited Drouot, we didn't realise that it wasn't just fine art that was being sold. It's like packages of old clothes and it's tremendous to watch. It's like being back in the time of Dickens, you know, it's, it must have been what Sotheby's and Christie's used to look like in the kind of late 18th, early 19th century, I think. And then I think you move back to London and you, you work with Contemporary Art Society and Tate. So you suddenly move perhaps into that more um contemporary art world in London yeah and I think I mean I I found out quite quickly that I wasn't really interested in working in the auction houses um and I just wasn't it, you know the object wasn't really enough somehow for me personally. um hmm. and the contemporary arts I mean basically I mean I think I wrote hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters asking people if I could just come for a week just to come and talk to them could I just have a few minutes of their time and just endless and and, and endless no's because I had nobody I had nobody to say look I've been speaking to so-and-so and they recommend I had nobody to put me in touch with all these people mm. so it was a, a pretty it was it was an uphill struggle but the Contemporary Art Society back then operated from uh, a really small office in Bloomsbury and it was a tiny little team of three amazing women who had just managed to raise four and a half million pounds for a, a, a from the heritage lottery or the lottery whatever it was called then um for a special collection scheme which was placing works in museums in scotland and uh and i think it was probably then that i realized that this the not-for-profit sector is actually so powerful as a generator of change and was doing really some of the most cutting edge uh, work that there is. Um, and it also opened the doors because they purchase works that are not just painting and sculpture. They also uh, had a huge emphasis on um, textiles and ceramics and glass and all of what is known as craft for some reason in this country. Um, 
and that really expanded my vision into realizing that you can't really get too hung up on the hung up on the material and that a lot and, and the hierarchies there's something slightly off perhaps about the hierarchies but that was a really valuable experience um and again met or came across a, a, a very important woman who was has you know re, who i remain in touch with and um has been a constant uh, support through many many years um and in fact i was just thinking that one of the other women i worked with in that organization and i was just a you know i was just an intern i wasn't really um a very important part of it they were probably more important to me um but she actually now sits on my um is head of the drawing room and sits on the selection panel for my drawing residency which is where I currently am so keep all these wonderful people that you meet close to you <laughs> because they you know they'll be there for an awfully long time people stay in the art world I found and they um and they're there to help at various different stages and then after that I went to Tate again it was just a very short thing but that gave me an insight into working in museums which I also wasn't very um seduced by I was perhaps more seduced by working you know doing a short stint at the V&A which I which was magical um but really what I suppose what I took away from that experience was that there was an amazing uh, curator we worked on Kandinsky the path to abstraction and there was an amazing very very senior Tate curator and I couldn't believe that he had bothered to invite me to have a cup of tea uh, and talk to me for half an hour, which I thought was just displayed an incredible generosity. And that for the first time, that was the first time I was in print because he'd actually acknowledged the assistance of every single person who'd worked on the project, including me, who was the most lowly of the lowly. Wow. Um, Which I thought was really excellent and something that I've really, uh, I think it's important to thank people, even Mm -hmm. people that, might not be perceived as important um, mm-hmm. by the rest of the world. I think everybody's mm-hmm. contribution is is very important to make things work. Does that so person that have that. to remain? Does that curator have to remain anonymous? I mean, you've said a very nice. That, thing. that was um, that Sean Rainbird. He then became director of the Stuttgart Museum. Yeah, I'm pretty certain that the contemporary art MA at the institute. I'm pretty certain he might have come and lectured. Uh, very um, early in the early millennium. I can't remember. I, it rings a bell anyway. Um, but that's really great to hear because uh, because sometimes you feel as though um, the, the you know the not for profit sector in the UK has a has a kind of slight reputation for being a bit over academic and introverted and maybe a bit arrogant at times. But it's really good to hear that these people are, are reaching out to everyone and acknowledging everyone's help. Gosh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that today. I probably shouldn't have said it. I'm probably totally That's wrong. That's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm thinking about when I tried to contact the British Museum and got no replies. Oh, probably because I'm no, probably because they see the name Sotheby's and they connect it to the, the market. I don't know. Um, well, there's a, there's an issue, isn't there? I mean, there's a definite. There's not. There aren't enough links. Well, there's a total separation of the commercial and the in the non-commercial world and they're sort of very very much at, at odds aren't they it's the it's interesting Claire that you say that because um I was actually actively involved in um at the institute um I I I took my student I used to take my students to the art fund um when it was not where it currently is when it was somewhere else mm. so I, some 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 you know down by Hyde Park, Hyde Park Corner I seem to remember and I got talking to them there and they we got talking and I said I'd really like to somehow do something about curing this gaping wound between the commercial and uh, not-for-profit sector museums because I understand that a lot of museum curators, particularly outside of the metropolis, they really struggle for funds to acquire works that they have to buy at auction. And it was really successful. So we we had this art fund. Um, the art fund organised it and we hosted it. I did a series of online short lectures about introducing the art market. And then all of these curators would sign up from to come from all over the country for a day in London. Mm. And the morning we'd have like panel sessions, which would include people in the British Museum that were used to working with the market, etc. And then in the mm. afternoon, we'd take them down and they'd visit Sotheby's, the auction house, and they'd visit mm. a few galleries. And they these people would speak to them and say, look, we really 
we we wherever possible we try and get our um vendors of works that don't necessarily need the money they they're, they're quite willing to um you know to do special deals for museums and so, and this was really successful so it ended up doing mm. something as you say to healing that that big gaping that yeah. gap between those two worlds and unfortunately when the pandemic came across we, we did it for several years and the art fund used to laugh they used to write to me and say the moment we advertise this it sells out in 45 seconds it's like Glastonbury tickets <laughs> because everybody wants to do it and and it was <laughs> wonderful because you'd, you'd meet these people at lunch and they'd be from these really weird museum you know small museums specializing in something really niche like you know pots and pans in early Georgian England and you know <laughs> and they were tremendous and but they would in the discussions they'd say we have no money you know and we put them together with these people and there were a lot of success stories after that you know people were working well together and anyway mm -hmm. it's just an interesting mm -hmm. example of uh, how if you tr if you reach out you can actually heal wounds yes. you know yes um, yeah so then i think you you then um started working with the uk friends of the national women National Museum of Women in the Arts, which I think is based in Washington, D.C. So can you talk about this growing interest in women in the arts? You've already it's already been a theme of what you've been saying, you know, with your talks of your your lecturers at, in art history and Elizabeth mm. Frick and so on. So how did this develop into becoming a trustee of the UK Friends of the National Museum of Women in the Arts? Well, I think it's something you're not really conscious of when you're studying mm. history of art. I mean, you're not sure. really conscious that there's a total absence of men until you are conscious of it and then you really can't quite you just can't quite believe it do you mean um, there's an absence of male teachers or an absence of women no, art an absence of women artists yeah sorry it, i thought it, yeah yeah it's just, it's just as if 50 percent of the population never existed and obviously yeah. this is subject to the fact that you know that you know there are there are historical reasons why women were not being trained, were not training as, as artists. And there are some, you know, notable exceptions where there are women artists who were successful, usually because they came from a family of artists or whatever. But oh. this uh, thought once lodged in, uh, in my mind, which was actually, um, I, the, the UK Friends of Numa was after I had been working in, um, the the Royal Society of Sculptors and in that they had an existing program which was that an artist could put a work an existing work in Holland Park for a year mm -hmm. and so one of the first things I did is I said right let's give women a bit of a platform let's make it only women artists mm -hmm. and just celebrate their contribution to the field of outdoor sculpture which is of course the theme which has <laughs> which has become rather large in my life um, and that was from 2016 onwards, I believe. And that was, yeah, that was, you know, quite, um, well, I started working there in, I think, 2010 or 2011. Okay. Um, and so I had this sort of, this this interest in women artists at that point, but it wasn't really fully developed mm. um, at that point. And then the UK Friends of Numbers, an interesting organization because there's a museum the the only museum i think still dedicated uh to the work of women artists in the world with a permanent collection they've got about five thousand works wow and it's based, based in washington mm -hmm. and then they have this network of uh 21 committees worldwide mm. which are basically self-managing established as charities and they'd have this great program which is called women to watch which um, happens once every two to three years on a theme set by the museum. So I was roped into it because um, I knew about sculpture and the theme was metal. And so they, uh, in typical sort of American, I don't know if you've ever worked with Americans, but it's an extraordinary, it's an extraordinarily direct way of working. Mm -hmm. And literally the feeling was being, you know, taken by the scruff of the neck. Come on, <laughs> you're good for this project. Let's do it. It's going to be great. So we did do it. And actually those were collaborations with auction houses. One, um, and we did a, a, a show at the Phillips, really snazzy gallery space in um, Barclay Square. Mm -hmm. um, artists like uh, Rana Begum, who was actually selected 
uh, and with whom I traveled to Washington to the museum with for the, the big women to watch show, which the mm. museum selects one artist from each of the committees that puts on a show. And then they put on this big exhibition at the museum. So it's a quite a major undertaking, mm -hmm. um, but a very interesting one. And it, it was, you know, it was fun to, it was fun to see how um, Americans work. And it was a, yeah, it was, it was a lot of work, but it was Can good. Can you remember the founding, the foundation dates of, um, of that museum? Can you approximately know when when it was opened first opened? Uh, I not very long ago. I think it was yeah. opened in the sixties or something like that. Mm, interesting, and and there there you, there isn't really anywhere else just totally dedicated to women artists. Well, there's that... now Museum Souche in Switzerland. Oh right, yeah, yeah. Um, Do you? I, I guess is, I guess it begs the I, question. I not... Sorry. Please. Yeah, but, I, but I'm not sure they have a collection. The same way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's do you think it opinion. begs? I mean, the do you think it begs the question? Do you know? In an ideal world, we shouldn't really have to talk about gender anymore. I mean, what do you think of that argument? You know that that once we've balanced, redressed the balance. I know that there's been a lot of pressure, if that's the right word, on museums over the last three or four, five years. To, to bring women artists out of their basements and put them on show one thinks of MoMA and Tate and so on to to make it a bit more 50 50. Uh, do you how do you see this going in the future do you think in the end I'm thinking of my son's generation he's like 24 so he's like Gen Z he says we're not even allowed to refer to gender when we were at you know you know you, you're not out you're not meant to talk about boys and girls men and women I just wonder whether in the end that will develop into a world where it doesn't matter whether someone's a man or woman or what their gender, sexuality or sexual identity is. Obviously, you and I have come, well, particularly you have uh, and me, um, have come out of generations where we've seen the fight for women's rights growing. You know, it, mm. my students would be appalled if they knew the sexism that was rife in university when I was there. And you probably suffered it as well to a certain extent. Um, mm. Do you think in the end this will balance out and, you know, no one will ask that question about the gender of an artist or do you think it's so entrenched that you still have to carry on working positively for it i think it's going to take an awfully long time mm -hmm. i mean we haven't really got very far if i'm honest about it mm -hmm. there is an awfully long way to go and there are a sure. lot of there are still a lot of very you know token gestures sure. going on um yeah. the the underrepresentation of women it just in Britain is, I mean, it's absolutely horrendous. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, across all the boards, not just in the art world, but in in just in the sphere I work in. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got something like uh, twenty three percent of women artists. Commercial galleries only represent twenty three percent of women artists. I mean, their auction sale prices are absolutely abominable compared to men yeah um, I think students done do their dissertations on that comparing the what's quite interesting Claire though is they compare the cultural value of women and men artists equivalents if you like with the financial value and often the women are, are, are much more culturally represented in like public museums maybe creating the kind of art that isn't so easy to to sell as buy and sell as a commodity I think that's maybe mm. one of the issues but it's a really really interesting subject um, and you're quite it's right. That, yeah. And I think a lot of the I think the interesting thing is that it's a very sort of systemic problem. Just talking about the contemporary, we leave aside the historical sure. and it's, say we leave aside anything before 1900. It's actually yeah. very interesting because the commercial and the reason I mentioned the commercial galleries is that they currently have such an impact on the museums, what the museums collect, what the museums sure. show. And it's a stronghold, really. They've got a stronghold on culture. And if they're not representing women artists for many reasons, particularly what you're talking about, that a lot of the work is not, you know, is not, not viable. Yeah. It's not viable mm. commercially, or they say it's not viable commercially, either because the collectors are not sufficiently sophisticated or interested, or for whatever reason that is, but they're not pushing uh, the women artists, then we're in a bit of a problem. You know, we're we're stuck. 
and it's actually not going to get any better. Mm-hmm. Um, so I doubt very much any time soon or within an, in anyone's lifetime we're going to sort this out. But we've got to really keep on going um, because, you know, it's a massively important it's a massively important issue. And I do sometimes get the feeling that it's just another mechanism of pushing us aside and pushing aside our contribution mm-hmm. to um, mm-hmm. to art, really, by saying that, oh, gender, you know, it does, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Yeah, no, make no, any I, get, I get that. It's and just... It's just that uh, that, the, younger the, generation, very... uh, that younger generation find it very hard to use the language and vocabulary of, of, of gender because they've almost been told by their universities, you can't do that anymore. You know, it's unisex toilets. You can't. It's, it's, it's quite an interesting development because it's not actually doing away with the problem, as you say, of the underrepresented no. women. One, one of the things I would say is I think that there are some green shoots, although they're quite ridiculous, watching mm-hmm. some contemporary auctions over the last year or two. You know, a lot of international collectors are now pay, they're, they're bidding, they're bidding uh, uh, with one another to buy works by what they perceive as interesting emerging women artists, mm-hmm. um, and particularly female, uh, sorry, particularly black women artists or or, or mm-hmm. artists of color. And you are seeing some of those artists being really, really highly sought after, who are who are often relatively young sort of women artists, and that's the market at work, obviously. Um, so yeah. so there are whether that will lead to more respect in the commercial sector for women artists and realizing that you know we've got to have more women artists in our stable of artists mm-hmm. certainly some of the contemporary commercial galleries I know I would say they're they're pretty well balanced between yeah. The, 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 yeah. The, the male and women artists that they now represent um mm-hmm. and they're not necessarily I mean, I do... run by women you know I mean, it is a tricky one because the the way that the world works currently is that you have to produce work and then you have to sell it and you have to produce a lot of work, which is very suitable to, you know, a male, for example, a a sort of standard, you know, standardised to the extent one can uh, life. Um, You know, the male sculptors, for example, tend to be uh, quite successful because mm-hmm. they are they don't have or they often don't have the childcare responsibilities they certainly don't have to get pregnant and have children sure. um, and and yeah. so there are you know a, a, a woman's typical uh, working cycle if they have children or even if they don't they often get uh, end up looking after older parents or there are, there are caring responsibilities that will be foisted on them at, at some point in most likely um it makes their working patterns a lot less linear yeah. and a lot less predictable and therefore in the current structure a lot less profitable so yeah. there's something there which actually has to change it's not so much just signing up a load of women artists and asking them to do the same thing that men have been doing and produce yeah. at the same level or extent uh, as the men have been doing it requires a bit of you know a bit of an overhaul really yeah um and I, it, I'm really interested to see how it will happen, but it's but it's a sustained, um, it's a sustained mission, and I, I think it will happen. I'm I'm a real optimist, and I think that it it will get there, but not uh, because of any other reason really than that. I think the work that women make uh, is very good, and it stands mm-hmm. on its own. It stands on its own two feet, really. No, it would absolutely be a exercise, you know, if if it weren't as good, if not better. Yeah, um, I remember in the eighties, I I think Birkbeck College asked me to do a, a a short series on 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 gender in art, which is quite strange to ask a guy to do it, I guess. Um, but mm. um, I I one of the lectures I or one of the series of lectures I I I took Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth. Honestly, mm. in the nineteen eighties, the first thing I did is I looked at their bibliography. Um, mm. The bibliography mm. of academic work on them. Hepworth yeah. had hardly anything. Moore oh, had sure. massive amounts. Now, and, of, and and then if you looked at the art market, you know, Moore was selling mm. for a huge amount more, <laughs> pardon the pun, yeah. than, than Hepworth. It's actually inverted now, arguably. So if you actually mm. look at recent, if you put a graph in and you look at the amount of academic literature since the turn of the millennium on Hepworth, far it seeds literature mm. on Moore. And and mm. also her prices are exceeding Henry Moore. So mm. it's, something has happened since the eighties in 
in yeah. those two very well-known modern British artists in the way we 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 respect and approach them, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. And of course, Hepworth mm -hmm. is, is is an interesting figure because she did have famously had triplets, but that took her out of London from the Blitz, as I understand it, down St Ives. And then Ben Nicholson, who was the father, I think he just walked off and left. Oh. Her. Yeah, so she's kind of left with the kids, but she's an example yeah. of someone who, against the odds, sort of, you know, managed to continue to create lots of amazing art. And it brings us on to your, the Procreate Project. Do you want to talk to the listeners about that? Because I think you're um, co-curator on the selection panel of this Procreate Project Mother Art Prize. Do you want to talk about what that's for? Yeah, so um, Procre Procreate Project was um, set up by two amazing women called uh, Diana Gravina and Paola Lucente. Yes. Um, and they their mission, essentially, is to uh, make more visible the work of artists, mothers, and indeed their plight and how difficult it is to make uh, work, which mm -hmm. actually Hepworth put very well uh, in relation to having all those children and she said a woman artist's work is characterized by interruption. Yeah. Constantly. Isn't that true in general of women in the, who are having to work in society? That, that we don't do enough for women in any kind of work, you know, with the maternity leave and then women maybe yeah. come yeah. back to work or they're discouraged from looking after their children. They might They might prefer to choose to look after their children. That makes life very difficult for them economically. Um, yeah. Isn't it also true of society, broader society? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but but the procreate really it, does it, very well. Is look at the work of artist mothers. It gives them a platform through mm -hmm. this uh, mother art prize, uh, mm -hmm. which has um, you know you select there are lots and lots of entries, um, and. Uh, Claire, can you hear me? Oh, apologies, everyone. There was a slight breakdown in the Wi-Fi then, but um, Claire has found another room in her out of the way. Uh, I think you're in the Cotswolds, did you say, or the Chilterns, the Cotswolds? Yeah, I'm doing a, I'm doing a drawing residency in uh, at Alpen Manor, which right. is um, in the middle of the Cotswolds with not very good, good reception. Sounds idyllic anyway. The, the video's cutting out a bit. Um, it, it may be an idea just for the final five to 10 minutes when we talk about cola. Well, keep your video on at the moment, but I, I, if it starts going, I may suggest that you switch your video off. That can often help the bandwidth. But anyway, the kind of climax really, I guess, that guess of the whole discussion is um, when you, you, you became director of the Colab Limited, I think 2017. So maybe you could tell the listeners about the mission of Colab um, and maybe past, present and future projects? So the, the CoLab started as the CoLab programme in, in 2011. And that's um, really what I uh, left a commercial gallery um, with uh, these grand ideas of setting up these very um, ambitious and complicated projects, which I managed to get funding for. And I took them to... Um, an organization called the Royal, what was then called the Royal British Society of Sculptors, which represents um, over 200 practicing sculptors. Um, and there we really started uh, from two, 2011 to 2017, the CoLab program, which consisted of um, three projects, one of which was really the start and the defining project that really looks to everything we've done since which was a series of uh, three residencies uh, each year. And uh, we gave the artists a studio space and some money. And we asked them to make a work uh, in a subterranean setting, in a historic setting, or in an ambulatory setting across London. So we found the space, we found the money, we got all the permissions in place. And then we just said, now you make a work that responds to one of these sites. And the sites were extraordinary. They were underneath Waterloo Station. They were in tunnel shafts. They were in the uh, lake at Chiswick. They were, it was a really amazing project. And that has really um, been what we have continued to do and what we see that, that there is a lack of. Um, 
after completing the programs, we the the choice was either to sort of manage a building project, a restoration of a building, or to become an independent uh, curator. And basically, that was that was the choice that was made, and it was definitely the best choice because there were no limits on what uh, we could actually do. Um, so the collab really creates these opportunities for artists to make uh, site responsive interventions into unusual places across England. Uh, and the idea really is that what we're striving to do is to see work made outside the confines of the white cube, which we believe is not really the right place for it. And to encourage artists, and we work particularly with female artists, but not always. And we work mainly with uh, sculptors. In fact, really the commissioning is solely with sculptors to make really their most wild and life affirming and ambitious. I don't really like the word ambitious, but they're the, the work they've always wanted to make. And we smooth the path for them. And the, the reason that this is really important in relation um, to women artists is that a lot of the work that is seen in um, outdoor spaces, because we work mainly outdoors, is tends to be by the same, you know, four or five male artists. And it is certainly um, could be said to be of a type. Uh, it's, you know, often a metal, you know, bronze or steel structure. It's often, um, you know, by a similar sort of group of, of, of artists. And so we really want to open the doors both for the benefit of the viewer and for the benefit of the artists, uh, you know, to, to, to seeing more and different and better work. Um, so the current, our, our current sort of headline project at the moment is called The Artist Garden, which is a half acre space on the roof of Temple Tube Station, which was totally derelict and neglected and only had a couple of homeless people and me on it really to start with, which we spent four years uh, negotiating with the landowners to, to use. And we were thankfully successful, um, managed to raise the money and launched the whole project in 2021. Um, it's been very successful. And we, the structure is basically that a female artist is asked to make a large scale work. And then two other artists are invited to come and do a residency in a little hut that we've built on the site. And it's a public space, but it's also quite a private space in that it's raised up from the uh, ground and you have to reach it by 10 steps. And you just have this wonderful sky as a canopy and it's right next to the Thames and you're totally secluded while still being right in the middle of London. So it's a very, very unusual and absolutely vast space that most people come to and they say, I can't believe I never knew this was there. <laughs> and then they come and it, you know, it very much is there. And the parameters of it are that it is a garden, which is obviously a human um, construct, a human imposition on, on the landscape, in this case, on the urban landscape. And the first artist, who was Lequena, interpreted this as um, a cue to make her vision of paradise a reality, which she has done brilliantly. We're currently showing through the Cosmic Allotment, which is actually a husband and wife collaboration um, by Hayward and Condy. And our next uh, large scale commission is an artist um, who you might know called Holly Hendry, who's making a vast drawing in space which will uh, be quite something. And that will be opening on the 6th of July. We, we also run a collaboration with the Royal College of Art in Yorkshire Sculpture Park, from which we um, select their graduate award winner who will make their first piece of outdoor work. Um, the idea really is just to take away all these barriers to creating outdoor work. Um, we have, you know, a really brilliant team of uh, project managers and structural engineers. Um, we have very close relationship with Westminster, who um, so both support the project and are very close partners and have been since the beginning. It's really, a, you know, 
a, a close collaboration with them. Um, and it's really just to demonstrate what women can do if they're given the chance, if all of these time barriers are removed. And the results have been <laughs> quite extraordinary. Um, and you should come really, the, everyone should come and see it because it's just such a, you know, it's it's such a great space. Um, and in terms of uh, future projects, the one that's uh, going to happen in, start happening in 2024 and 2025 is the Morecambe Bay Triennial, which is where we have this lovely hundred miles of coastline and we will be making, um, really building a whole arts ecology in partnership with all the artists and arts organizations around the bay um and it will see some great site responsive work being made uh, about both you know the people and the place and the landscape and it's going to be uh, a very exciting thing and we intend to base it on uh, residencies so people will have to really their work will have to be embedded in the place rather than parachuting in um work that people might find interesting <laughs> however tempting that may be um so those are the two sort of big things that are going on and i'm actually speaking from um this place where we where we run every year uh, a residency program called body in place and this is really again linked to the um process of drawing and how this um unlocks artists who you know be they sculptors or painters or whatever they whatever form their practice takes we think it's a very important um, part of the creative process that is not practiced as much or in a way that it should be um, and so we are just using this as a platform to explore different ways of teaching and learning about drawing and you know making the case for reintegrating it into people's practice so we have 10 artists, professional artists a year who come here for five days and they are taught and they learn and they teach the teachers and um, and they become friends and they and it has a huge impact on their on their work going forward. Uh, and it's really an important part of what we do and actually probably my favorite week in the year, I have to say, <laughs> especially when it's like today when the sun is shining and um, and people uh, people work outside as well as inside. Absolutely. The idea is really we're looking at the life room and whether the life room, you know, hasn't really substantially changed since the 19th century. Um, and whether if we take the body out of the context of the life room, we are bringing something different to the idea of drawing. And also the body really has to be central to all drawing because we, you know, you you create and you draw with your your body it's 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 the unity of your eye your hand and your mind and it's a it's a very essential thing to do so really it's looking at getting people to look at the body and draw and rethink the way that they convey ideas of space and and time really um through their work so it's and you a said, really you said earlier in the podcast Claire that you weren't very good at drawing do you take part in this are you learning i have i have um i have done one of the courses um and i got lost <laughs> at one point but it is actually extraordinary how you um how it really changes your perception of the yeah. world even yeah. if it's not really about what the product on the page it's really about how you see the world so i think really everybody should draw especially yeah. art historians I, I agree. When, when we ever go, when we do our study trips abroad to Venice and Torino, I always say to students, just all of you, whether you think you can draw or not, take a little sketchbook. And when you're sitting having coffee, just spend five yeah. minutes because you'll just see everything in a very different yeah. way. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right in that. And I think there's a there's a general sort of trend. I think it is becoming slightly more popular to do to do drawing. But I mm. think if you want to understand the composition of a painting or the reason that people have put things in a certain way then the only way you can really understand it is if you draw and I mean you know some of these paintings took many 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 months to construct the composition yeah and they, everything is very intentional so if you want to unpack that intention you have to kind of 
you know, unveil the true, uh, what's underneath, really. It's a great um, point. Claire, thank you very, very much for being the guest today. And I think the listeners are going to find this really absorbing and and, and, and unusual, if I may so, in a, in a very good way. Because you're, I think for the first time, I, I have had guests who are artists, but it's quite, it, just where you're coming from is just such a different thing because you're curatorial, but you're involved in the language of the artists. And it's just such a great insight into um, that, 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 that hope for the future of women artists as well, in particular, that you're supporting so well in all of your kind of trusteeships and selection panels and so on. So, you know, wish I'm sure that all all the listeners with myself will wish you, you know, good luck in the future and with your projects. And I will uh, put some links on when I publish this and particularly people should go to, to look at Temple Underground Station, which funny enough, I saw... I was suddenly became aware of your garden for the first time when I was, I'd been to the ballet with my son, um, Wolf Works, which was mm, interesting amazing. about Virginia Wolf. <laughs> and we were yes. walking past and I said, oh, that's interesting. And he, you know, he just rushed on, let's get home. I need to eat, you know, and I thought I must come back here. And then suddenly here I am talking to the person who's behind the project. So it's been fantastic. Yes. Well, come, it's open access, public space, yeah. Come any time from dawn to dusk, any day of the year. Brilliant. Uh, Sounds and fantastic. You can come and talk to an artist, come and see the work. It's a really special, special place. I, I think that's the, just to, to sum up, I think one of the important things that you're doing all the time is uh, the importance of residency, that the artist shouldn't just drop in as they're often, you know, the male artist is often, the kind of celebrity male artist is often just commissioned to do something. They just come in and drop it there and go away. I, I'm not saying that, that, you know, there are plenty of male artists who like the residents as well, but I think it's so important because it's part, they become part of the community and people who think they don't like art, they get chatting to these people. They think, oh, you're just like me, you know, you just got a different interest, that's all. So I think it's really, really important to, in, what, to do, encourage what you're doing with the artists engaging with the community. Absolutely, because it demystifies really what artists do. And it's very good for the artists because they get to talk to the public, which they never yeah. get to talk which to. Which is good for and them so as well. They don't become <laughs> isolated and so on. <laughs> get out, out of the bubble. Anyway, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, David. I've, it's been fascinating. Thank, thank you, Claire. And um, see you later. Bye. Bye-bye.